Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Decoding Daniel. We are now at episode 24 and today our topic is the mark of the beast. But before we dive in, we're going to ask Elder David if he would pray for us. All right, let's bow our heads. Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, I just ask that you would open the eyes of our understanding. I ask that the entrance of your word would bring light, that you would give light to the simple. Father, I just ask that you would reveal these things, um, that you haven't revealed these secrets to the proud, but you've opened them to the humble and simple people. Lord, we just ask that you would make these things known to us. Father, I just ask that you'd give us your Holy Spirit. I ask that you would, uh, that our hearts would burn within us as we you draw nigh to teach us the things that are essential for us to understand for this time. Father, we just recognize that everybody talks about the mark of the beast, but so few actually understand what it is. And Father, I know that you wouldn't tell us not to get the mark of the beast if we couldn't figure out what it was. Right. So, Father, we just ask that you would give us wisdom. Lord, you said if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And so we're asking, you said, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Lord, make us, uh, give us the wisdom to ask until we're joyful with what you've shown us. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, Elder David. Yes, there is a lot of talk about what the mark of the beast is, but we take our thoughts from the word of the Lord. That's right. All right, so as usual, we start with our quiz from last time. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get our quiz starting. Okay, are you able to see that, Elder David? There it comes, yes. Right. Okay, so let's get right into our quiz. So quiz question number one, is it true or false? The second coming of Christ will be visible, personal, and accompanied by a lot of noise. True or false? And number two. The Bible indicates that the saints will be raptured out of the world before the final time of trouble. Thus, the saints will not have to go through the troublous times of the last days. True or false? Number three, when Christ comes to gather his saints, only the righteous will know it. True or false? And number four, the great dark day occurred on May 19, 1780. The falling of the stars occurred November 13 of 1833. True or false? And number five, the signs of the times indicate that we are not living in the time of the end today. True or false? And now for the answers. Number one was indeed true. And number two, uh, that's false. Beep. <laughs> <laughs> and number three is also false. Everybody will know. <laughs> and number four is true. Right. Know your dates. And number five is absolutely false. Today, we're going to be talking about the mark of the beast. And Elder David is going to start us off with conflict in the book of Daniel. Okay. Uh, the stories in the book of Daniel illustrate the crisis of the pro that the prophecies foretell God's people will go through at the end time. Two of these are the stories of the fiery furnace in Daniel 3 and the lion's den in Daniel 6. So number one, what did Nebuchadnezzar command people to worship in Daniel 3, 4 through 6? Did you want to read that or should we just read the, the answer? Yeah, so number one. Yes. Uh, what did Nebuchadnezzar command 
people to worship in Daniel 3, 4 through 6. So it's the golden image. Right. Note, the image was erected on the plain of Dura. And we read about that in lesson five. Those who refused to bow down and worship the image were to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Here was an attempt by Nebuchadnezzar to force people to worship false gods and to break the commandment of God that forbade bowing down to images. The issue was clearly false worship and disobedience to the commands of God. Okay, number two. What was Daniel's what was Daniel prohibited from doing in the crisis of Daniel 6? Daniel 6:7. 6, okay, I have that. It says all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of the O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. So whoever shall ask a petition of any god or any man for 30 days. Okay. Well, Daniel 3, there was an inducement to false worship. Daniel 6, there's a command that prohibits, prohibits genuine worship. Daniel is not allowed even to pray to his God. In this crisis that will come to God's people in the time of the end, both issues will be present. At first, the authorities will attempt to induce them to false worship. When that fails, the authorities will eventually prohibit the true worship of God. The conflicts in the book of Daniel will be repeated in the end time. The book of Revelation contains, uh, contains the startling details. So let's look at that. Yes. Gabrielle, you take over. Show right. us. Yes, thank you, Elder David. Yes, the beast in Revelation 13. Many persons have read this chapter, but now we're going to bring to light by the help of the Holy Spirit the meaning of it. So we'll start off, and Elder David, I'll ask you to read uh, verses 1 and 2 of Revelation 13 with a description of the beast in Revelation 13. Okay. And it says this, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns and upon his horns, 10 crowns and upon his heads, the name blasphemy. And the beast, which you saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. All right. So here we have a clear description of this beast. And if you continue reading, like, right up to verse 10, it is clearly um, primarily describing the papal system as it operating, operated during the Dark Ages. And if we remember, the Dark Ages was from 538 to 1798. The Dark Ages was the time when Christians were persecuted. More than 50 million Christians lost their lives. 50 million, that's a lot. The beasts mentioned here are the same as Daniel's beasts in chapter 7. And if you look back at episodes 9 and 15, you can review some of the details. And I once read something where this teacher gave his students some verses to circle in Daniel chapter 7. In fact, Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, verse 20 to 21, 24 to 25, and Revelation 13, verses 2 to 8 and 18. And the, the 666 is not mentioned, but 666 is not the sole identifier. And even if it's excluded, it's not the identification of, you know, the, 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 the identification of this power that we're talking about is still clear. It is the papal system. Yes. The little horn of Daniel 7 is identical to the sea beast of Revelation 13 is talking about the papacy, the papal system. So these two chapters are referring to the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. All right, let's continue. Number four, what happened to the papacy at the end of the Dark Ages? And remember, the end of the Dark Ages was in what? 1798. Now, Elder David is going to read verse 3 and 10. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, 
and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. That's verse 3. And verse 10 says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience of the and faith of the saints. Right. So we see here where it says one of his head was what? Wounded. What does wounded mean? What do you understand? De de deadly wound. Yeah. 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 And it was a wound, mortal wound. Yeah. Something happened, right? To, to stop it from doing its work, right? When we are wounded, we can't probably walk or we can't do our day-to-day -day activities. So this is the same thing that happened. And in 1798, we're going to match it now. In 1798, which we say was the end of the Dark Ages, um, the French general under... Um, Napoleon, his name was Berthier, the French general, he took the Pope captive, right, made him a prisoner. And then this is what we refer to as this deadly wound, right? So it, it received a deadly wound when the Pope was captured, because when the Pope was captured, that crumbled the what? The, the papacy no longer had... Uh... Uh, supremacy. No, no, in other words, he didn't have civil power to kill people. You right. know, when like when uh, Israel wanted to kill Jesus, they couldn't because they did not have sovereignty. They had right. to get the Romans to kill him. Well, the papal power had sovereignty. They could kill whoever they wanted. They had civil authority to do that. They lost that right. in 1798. Correct. Yeah, so that's what we are explaining there. All right, let's move on to number five. What was to happen to the papacy after he received the deadly wound? Revelation 13 and verse three. It says, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and the deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. So after receiving the deadly wound in 1798, the papacy was to be re Five. Eventually, the whole world would wonder after this revived papacy. Revelation 13, 11 to 13, sorry, 11 to 18, adds some very significant details. However, it points out that this revived papacy will not stand alone. It predicts that another power would join with it to force people into worshiping the first beast, the papacy. And we are going to talk about that other power because it's there mentioned in uh, Revelation 13, another beast that rise up. So let's look at that. I think we talk about Mussolini um, in our previous episodes. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's continue to number six. Describe the second beast that John sees in Revelation 13, verse 11. And it says, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake like a dragon. All right. So we see the beast coming out of, out, out of the earth. earth. Right. So let me see if I can go back. Right. Coming up out of the earth. And it had two horns like a lamb. Now think of a lamb. All right. The characteristics of a lamb. And then this lamb like this spake as a dragon. Does, is this matching up? A lamb wouldn't speak as a dragon, would it? Well, every time a lamb is mentioned in Revelation, it's referring to Christ. So this is a Christian power. Right. Yeah. So that's what we're getting into. We're the Christian figure... power should not speak like the dragon. In Revelation 12, it says the dragon was the devil. So it, it represents a Christian nation, but he begins to speak like the devil. Right, a Christian and persecute nation. God's people. Right, like, that was like Rome did. Exactly. All right. So let's continue so that we can put all the dots together. Number seven. Where did the first beast come from? Verse one. I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Right. So he came out of the sea. All right. And what do the seas represent? And we are going to ask the Bible. We're going to let the Bible in interpret itself. Revelation 17 and verse 15 tell us the representation of seas. See, and this is why you can't rely on private interpretation. The Bible must interpret itself. And this is what it says. 
And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. All right. So the sea represents what? Peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the second beast, that lamb-like beast with the with the two horns, with speaking like a dragon, it rose up out of the earth, right? But the first beast rose up out of the sea. Now, if the sea represents people and multitudes and nation, what does the earth represent, right? It must represent an underpopulated area, right? Yes. Area of the earth. So just the opposite. All right. Question nine. What happens to the first beast as John sees the second beast arising, verse 10. Says, and he that leadeth into captivity, because he put all the Christians in prison and killed them and tortured them mm -hmm. during the dark ages. It says, he shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Right. So the first beast, at the same time, the second beast is rising up. The first beast is going into captivity. So notice what is happening here. So John sees the second beast arising at the same time. The first beast is going into captivity. And remember, we said that that was around 1798. All right. The Dark Ages ended 1798. So let's try to put everything together now. Number 10, how does John describe the second beast in verse 11? We read that before, so I could, I'll, just, I'll just read the answer. He said it had two horns like a lamb, right? Elder David, you read that earlier. Yeah, yes, and then that's it's, right. Yeah, right. And he spake as a dragon. Now you wouldn't expect a lamb to be speaking as a dragon. But if you can look at the screen, can you find, do you know what that outline, what country that is? Some of you do geography, probably will guess it. <laughs> well, in 1798, while the Pope was going into captivity, in 1776, a new nation was being born. And none other than good old USA. Yes. So a lamb, it says here, is a symbol of innocence and freedom. In its beginning, this second beast, we're talking about the second beast arising out of the earth, this beast that you're seeing here with the two horns like a lamb and speaking as a dragon, in its beginning, this second beast would appear to be an innocent, freedom-loving nation, but eventually it will speak as a dragon. Mm. The Bible characterizes this second beast as a power that arises around 1798. Elder David just gave you the exact date in a new sparsely populated country instead of arising out of the teeming multitudes of Europe like the first beast in uh, Revelation 13 verse 1. In its beginnings, it's lamb-like innocence and freedom love. It's sorry, it is lamb-like innocent and freedom loving, but eventually it will speak as a dragon only one power on earth meets these specifications the united states of america certainly we can be thankful for america and the great freedoms it allows but the bible predicts the time will come when america the united states of america will no longer be the freedom loving nation that has characterized its first 200 years of ex existence it will speak as a dragon. Now, what are some of the biblical characteristics of the United States of America? It will arise from a sparsely populated area. It will arise about 1798 AD. In the beginning, it will be an innocent, freedom-loving nation, but ultimately it will speak as a dragon. Its mission will be to exalt the sea beast, that's the beast, the papacy, the Roman power, and by means of deceptive miracles to make the whole world, this is the, the second beast now, the second beast is going to make the whole world to worship the revived sea beast of verse one. So do not misunderstand us. It says here, I love America. We love America. Nevertheless, we have to tell you what the Bible says about the USA. Number 11, how does the dragon speak? Very interesting. How does the dragon speak? Let's look at Revelation 12 and verse 13. 
one chapter says, behind. Sorry. Yes. And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman who brought forth the man child. So notice how the dragon speak. He speak how? With persecution. By, with persecution. And the woman we know in prophecy represents what? The church, uh, right? Church, and then yeah. that, yeah, that, that woman, the pure woman represents uh, the pure church, right? And br bringing for the man child representing Jesus. Jesus, yeah. Right. So the dragon persecuted God's church, right? So we're trying to put all the dots together. So let's move on to verse number 12. It says, whose power does the United States exercise and what does it cause people to do? Verse 12 of our main chapter. Revelation 13. And it says, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. He makes them worship. Right. So the United States, and you can see the outline of the map there on your screen, it exercised all the power of the papacy, of the Roman power, right? And not only that, it caused the earth and them which dwell therein to do what? Worship, Worship. the first beast, whose deadly wound was what? Was healed. healed. Now, when your wound is healed, you can do your activity once more, right? If, if I got a cut on my foot, and my foot got yields. Now I can walk and I can go to work and I can go shopping. So this beast is going to be able to do what it was doing before. And we learned that the dragon speaks by persecuting. All right. So let's put the dots together. Let's continue with number 13. What does the second beast do in order to convince the world to worship the first beast, Revelation 13, verses 13 and 14. It says, and he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound with the sword and yet lived. Right, so doeth what? Great wonders to deceive, right? Not only that, it's deceiving, sorry, I mean, continuing on, it deceived by what? By the miracles. Hmm. You know, through false signs, wonders, and miracles, the United States and its people will join hands with the revived papal system or papal apostasy and convince the world that they have God's truth because of all the miracles being performed. Hmm. So does it mean that if we see miracles, it must be God? What does the Bible teach us? There are some scriptures. But before we do that, I wanted to point out in, in number 12, when we said what whose power does the United States exercise and what does it cause people to do to worship the first beast? The issue in the conflict is, the same issue that we have seen throughout the book of Daniel, the issue of true worship versus false worship. The first beast, and we're talking about the Roman power now because we've identified the first beast as the papacy, the Roman power. So the first beast, papacy, Roman power, persecuted those who disagreed with it. The second beast, United States, will likewise persecute descenders in its attempt to force people to worship this first beast, the first beast being the papacy, whose deadly wound is now yield. Now let's continue and see. Yes, but before I was saying that miracles are no proof that they are from God. Revelation 16 and, and verse 14. Elder David, could you read that for us? Because Sometimes when we see miracles, many of us would say this is from God. But let's see what the Bible tells us in Revelation 16 and verse 14. And it says, for they are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. 
So Elder David, somebody might be watching this and saying, well, how do I know that these miracles are from God or from Satan? That's a good question. And we must know the word of God. We have to have the Holy Spirit to lead us, right? So we can know right. if someone confesses not Jesus Christ and they're performing miracles, we can be sure that those miracles do not originate from God. The origin is of the enemy, right? And we have to live so in so close a connection with heaven so that we can identify. Do you That's remember right. when Jesus was on earth and he cast out demons? Yes. Yes. I don't or know. Yeah, go ahead, Elder David. Remember when Moses went to deliver God's people from, from Egypt and he threw down his rod and it became a serpent and the magicians, they threw down, down their rods and it became serpents too. So there was they were doing miracles, but Moses' rod ate up their rods, their, their serpents. So God's miracles. So, so we can expect to see miracles on God's side as well as miracles uh, by the false worship. But by the word of God and by the spirit of God, um, we will be able to tell the difference. Right. Amen. Continuing on, number 14. What does the second beast create as a result of all these miracles? Verse 14 of our main, main text. Revelation 13, 14 says, And he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying unto them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wounded been wounded by a sword and to live all right so they should make what an image an image is a likeness the beast power was a union of what church and state political yes. and religious can you imagine when political and religious power comes together elder david what do you have well you have one person's religion thinking that they're right and they're using the state to force everybody to do what they believe is right. Forcing a man's conscience coming between their creator and their conscience is an act that God disdains. All right. So the beast power was a union of church and state persecuting those who what disagreed mm -hmm. An image to the beast would therefore be an American corporation of church and state that will persecute those who disagree. So we see the formation of the image of the beast when America combines with the papacy. Number 15, what does the image of the beast proclaim will be done to those who do not worship it? Revelation 13 and verse 15. It says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So death in the face of death. And, you know, Elder David, there is a book that I love to read. It's called The National Sunday Law by Jan Markinson, I think. Yes, that's good. Yeah, that's a good book, guys. If you're watching this, it's a good book to grab old off it's called the national sunday law i think the the author is j-a-n jan markinson yeah. markinson i got it correct yes. yes that's a good book to read about this topic that we're talking about tonight and explain in more detail all right so we have been warned in saint john 16 and verse 2 isaiah 5 and verse 8 about you know the image of the beast the catholic Chism of the Catholic Church, it says, and listen to these, Sunday is expressly distinguished from the Sabbath, which it follows chronologically every week. For Christians, its ceremonial observance replaces that of the Sabbath. Hmm. In Christ's Passover, Sunday fulfills the spiritual truth of the Jewish Sabbath and announces man's eternal rest in God. Sunday, okay? Those who lived according to the old order of things have come to a new hope, no longer keeping the Sabbath, no longer keeping the Sabbath, but the Lord's day in which our life is blessed by him and by his death. The Sunday celebration of the Lord's day and his Eucharist is at the heart of the church's life. 
Sunday is the day on which the Paschal mystery is celebrated in light of the apostolic tradition and is to be observed as the foremost holy day of obligation in the universal church. In respecting religious liberty and the common good of all, Christians should seek recognition of Sundays and the church's holy days as legal holidays. They have to give everyone a public example of prayer, respect, and joy, and defend their traditions, their traditions, as a precious contribution to the spiritual life of society. Page 528. If a country's legislation or other reasons require work on Sunday, the day should nevertheless be lived as the day of our deliverance, which lets us share in this festive, festal gathering, this assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. So in brief, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. The Sabbath, which represented the completion of the first creation, has been replaced by Sunday, which recalls the new creation inaugurated by the resurrection of Christ. The church celebrates the day of Christ's resurrection, which we know was on a Sunday, on the first day, Sunday, which is rightly called the Lord's Day. Now, according to the Bible, and we're not going to go through these verses. We're putting them up on the screen for you to read some of them. Which day is the Lord's day? Exodus 20, verse 10. Read them for yourself, friends. We're not making this up. Isaiah 58 and verse 13, Matthew 12 and verse 8, Mark 2, 27 and 28, and Luke 6 and verse 5. All of those scriptures, Elder David, it will point out to which day? To the Sabbath. The seventh day, the Sabbath. Is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Amen. All right, let's move on to number 16 because it's all tied in together we did an episode on the sabbath so you can watch the previous episodes 16 what does this revived papal american union now impose on people verse 16 it says and he causes that means he makes all both small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads so this re revived papal American power, the first beast, it causes to receive a mark in their what? Their right hand or in their foreheads. Foreheads. Now, question 17, what happens to those who do not receive this mark in verse 17? And that no man might buy or sell, save he that has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So no man might be able to buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the beast. Now, this second beast that we're talking about, which we now see to be a coalition of what? American religious leaders with a revived papal apostasy will seek to persecute those who disagree with it. It will impose the mark of the beast with all its economic restrictions, won't be able to buy or sell, and ultimately will attempt to execute the death penalty upon those who do not worship this power to worship the beast does not mean a person needs to join the beast power only one only had to bow in humble obe obeisance to the authority of the beast power and thereby worship the beast if we remember in daniel chapter three with the three hebrew boys they refused to bow and they were persecuted right they were threatened with death right. thrown in uh, over, with the furnace amen um over to you elder david to tell us a little bit more because we're starting to connect the dots the mark of the beast okay yeah so let's look at the mark of the beast let's see what the bible might say it's going to it's going to uh, study a little here and a little there like the bible says so what does the papacy think it has the ability to do in Daniel 7.25? Right. It says, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the sins of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. Sorry, so dividing says, of time. 
Yeah, so he's a blasphemous power, speaks pompous words against the Most High, it says in another place. Um, and he, he uh, persecutes the saints, so it's a persecuting power, and he mm -hmm. thinks to change times and laws. Notice, the history bears out that the Roman church indeed did change the times and laws by attempting to change God's sacred seventh day Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. She did this not by authority of Christ or the Bible, but by her own authority. Remember, we looked at that in uh, lesson 11. Yeah, episode 11, we call it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, and, and number 19. Does the Roman church agree with history about the change of the Sabbath? And it mentions uh, some of the things from our um, exhibit. Shall I read some of those? Yes, yes, sure. Okay. Question, what is the third commandment? Answer, the third commandment is a, re re a reminder to keep the holy Keep holy the Sabbath day. Question, what is the Sabbath day? Saturday is the Sabbath. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. That's from the Converts Catechism of the Catholic Doctrine on page 50. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another one. Question, how... How do you prove that the church has power to command feasts and holy days? Answer, by the very act of changing the Sabbath into Sunday, which Protestants allow of, and therefore they fondly contradict themselves by keeping Sunday strictly and breaking most of their, most of their feasts commanded by the same church. So these are actually quotations showing that the church admitted she changed the Sabbath from they Saturday to Sunday. They removed the solemnity from the Sabbath day that God blessed. If you go back, we go back to Genesis chapter 2. God blessed the seventh day and he hallowed it. And then the Catholic is saying that this is the mark of their authority. So, Elder David, could you just read a, li a little bit about the note on the question 19 and tell us a little bit more about that? It's very yes, it says... Uh, since the Roman church so clearly fulfills the identity of the mark of the beast and the little horn delineated in Revelation 13 and Daniel 7, even admitted to attempting to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, it becomes clear that the Roman church is the beast of Revelation 13. Mm -hmm. And continuing on. If the Roman church is the beast, then the mark of the beast would be a mark or a sign of the authority of the Roman church. If we wish to discover what the mark of the beast is, we simply have to ask the Roman church, what is the mark of your authority and power? That's a good question. I believe that's the next question too, right? Well, let's look at number 20. Let's see what it says. <laughs> what does the Roman church claim is the mark of her authority and power? Um, a, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change from Saturday to Sunday was her act, and the act is the mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Did you hear that? Did you see that, friends? It's on the screen. The Catholic Church claims that the change from Sabbath to Sunday was her mark, her mark of power. Hmm. That's the mark of her authority. If she has the power to change Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, that's what she claims is the mark of her power. Right. B, it says, it was the Catholic Church which transferred the rest to Sunday. Thus, the observance of Sunday by the Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church. Isn't that interesting? Uh, no. Notice, it's... what a bold admission. The Bible indicates that the Roman church is the beast. The beast says her mark of authority is her ability to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Thus, the mark of the beast is the Roman church's attempt to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. This she claims to be, uh, to describe, uh, 
Let's see. Thus she, this she claims to be the mark of her authority and power. When Revelation 13 describes the time when no man shall buy or sell unless he has the mark of the beast, it is talking about the United States enforcing Sunday keeping by legislation in order to get people to worship and bow to the authority of the Roman church. Please note that no one has the mark of the beast today. It is yet to come, but when it comes, God's people must resist it. Uh, to keep the mark of the beast is to fail to keep God's sacred Sabbath and the sign of our relation with God. To the people of God, a relationship with him is more important than obedience to the beast. Uh, you'll notice it says that this, this power causes or it forces. Mm -hmm. It's not until laws are made that are forcing people to right. keep Sunday, forcing right. them not to work on Sunday. That's when the mark of the beast uh, is going to be taken. And then, um, like it says in the book of Daniel, then they're going to make it illegal to worship the true God. They're going to make it so that you can't worship according to the commandment of God on the true Sabbath day. Yes, and these are all future events which are coming upon the world. So we yes. need to have a mark from God. Does God have a mark? Oh, that's a good question. Why don't you take us to that one? Yes, that takes us into the seal of God, all right? And let's start it off by question number 21. What is to be placed in the forehead of God's servants before these final climatic events take place? Revelation 7 and verse 2 and 3. Revelation 7, 2 and 3. <laughs> While I'm looking that up, that picture on the screen there? That's my cousin. <laughs> my uncle had all of those pictures of the of um, um, painted by an artist, and he used my cousin as this picture right here. So is that true? Are you joking? Uh, no, I'm, I'm serious. No, that's. Oh, okay. I thought yeah. you were joking. <laughs> no, so they used they used these pictures that my uncle had uh, had a famous artist draw. And they use them all the time on all kinds of Adventist media. So, <laughs> wow, you're famous, Elder David. I mean, well, no, I just know people who are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, praise Revelation the Lord. seven, two Revert and three, two and three, and that says, "And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice." to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and to the sea, saying, do not hurt the earth and the sea. Oh, yeah. Um, Neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. All right. So before these final climatic events, something is going to take place. The seal of God. Now let's talk a little bit more about what this means and where it is. Question 22, where are the servants of God sealed? According to Revelation 7 and verse 3, Elder David just read it. It says in their foreheads. In their foreheads. Is this your cousin too, Elder David? Nope. nope. Okay, just checking. Somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the seal is placed in their foreheads. What does God write in our foreheads or our minds? According to Hebrews 8, Elder David, and verse 10. Hebrews 8, 10. If God writes something, we want to find out what it is, right? <laughs> That's right. It says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. This is talking about the new covenant. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. That's the new covenant. Right. So what does God write in our foreheads, in our minds? He writes his laws i will put my laws into their mind now where is the seal of god found in god's law exodus 20 and verse 8 to 11 most of us can just repeat this from memory but we're going to read it right exodus 20 verse 8 to 11 while elder david is finding that 
He says, if God writes his law in our minds and the seal of God is placed in the mind, then it follows logically that the seal of God is found where? You got law. it correct. Yes, in the law. So every seal of any government official or any seal on any legal document is three essential parts. The person's name, the person's title, and the person's dominion. So God's seal, likewise, must have his name, his title, and his dominion. So we're going to find out now in Exodus 28 to 11, where is the seal of God? Yes, this is very fascinating. And it says, and some of you might know this very well, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor, nor thy manservant or maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made, there's one, the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, that's dominion, and rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, made it holy. Amen. So where is the seal of God found in his law? We right can see there. In the largest the, commandment. Right, in the fourth commandment. So Lord God, maker of the heaven and earth, God's name, God's title, and God's dominion are found only in the fourth commandment. Can you believe that? It's not found in the first, the fifth, or the tenth. It's found in the fourth commandment. Amazingly, God has placed his seal in the Sabbath commandment, just as the beast has put his mark in the Sunday commandment. The saints are sealed in their minds with the seal of God, indicating that spending this quality time with God in proper Sabbath keeping, they have developed a deep personal relationship with Christ. Only those who have such a deep personal relationship will be able to resist the imposition of the mark of the beast. So Daniel and those Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had a deep personal relationship with the Lord. Now, what does the seal contain? We talked about it before. The name of the person in charge, the title of the person in charge, and the territory over which that person rules. So for example, we see this before, seal of the president of the United States. So you have the name, for example, George Bush. The title is what? President, territory, United States of America. In the same manner, Jesus, God, his name is God. His title is creator, his territory, heaven, earth, sea, and all that in them is. Now, are, did, did we connect those dots? We hope those are connecting for you. 25, what warning does God give concerning the mark of the beast? And Elder David, Revelation 14, 9 and 10. And while Elder David is finding Revelation 14, 9 and 10, why would God give a warning concerning the mark of the beast if it's not important for us to know, right? Yes. So let's see the warning. I want to hear what warning this is. And friends, you should hear this warning too, because it's coming from our best friend. Very solemn it is too. It says, the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment, was it just 9 and 10? Sorry. Just 9 and 10, yes. So okay. we see the warning here. This is the most severe warning in all scripture. The warning against the mark of the beast. So clearly God does not want anyone to receive this mark. The beast power threatens men with death if they don't receive the mark of the beast. God warns that people who receive the mark of the beast will suffer eternal death. So here, all the issues foretold in the book of Daniel come together. The whole world is forced to make a decision regarding obedience to God and the worship of God or obedience to the beast and the worship of the beast. This is not a question between just Saturday and Sunday. The day we keep is only the outward symbol. The real issue is who is the supreme person in our life? Is it Christ or Antichrist? Is it Jesus or is it the beast? The day we honor and keep 
in this final crisis will reveal who is the supreme authority over our lives. The Sabbath is not a minor issue because the real issue over the Sabbath is our relationship with God. To God's people, nothing is more important than their relationship with God. That's why they refuse to worship the beast and receive this mark. So this is a solemn warning. 26. When faced with a similar command by Nebuchadnezzar, how did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego respond? According to Daniel 3 and verse 16 to 18. And while Elder David is finding that verse, I really love that verse. And you're going to see why. Some of you already know it. Some of you may be the first time hearing it. It says, if, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. All right, so they chose death. You know, the events of ancient Babylon have close parallels to the events under the imposition of the mark of the beast. God's people in both cases were threatened with what? Death, if they did not worship the image. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego declare boldly that whether God deli delivered them or not, they would not worship the image. In the last days when the mark of the beast is inflicted, God's people, like the three Hebrews, will make the same decision. Whether God delivers them or not is unimportant. They have settled the issue. Friends, have you settled the issue? God is supreme authority in their lives and nothing can swerve them from obedience to God and the worship of God, even if they're threatened with death. Is it the same for us today? Friends, it is your desire. Is it your desire to avoid the mark of the beast by beginning now to develop a strong personal relationship with God through daily Bible study and prior and a regular keeping of God's seven day Sabbath on Saturday? I know it's my decision. Remember, it is not about a day. It's about whom you choose to worship and obey, God or man. Yes, that's right. Friends, if it is clear to you from this, lesson that the sabbath sunday question is the outward issue in the mark of the beast but that the real issue is the setting aside of time to build a strong relationship with god we want you to write time type sorry type amen in the comment section and if it is your desire to prepare now to avoid the mark of the beast by keeping holy god seven day sabbath from sundown friday to sundown saturday we want you to raise your right hand where you are and if you feel that you're going to have some problems with keeping the Sabbath, perhaps with a job or with family, and you would like us to pray with you for that problem, we want you to type pray for me in the comment section. And if you still have some questions regarding the Sabbath and you would like to have them answered before you make your decision, send us an email at priorpowerprinciples at gmail.com and we will be praying and answering your question. Or you could just type your question in the comment section or you could just visit one a local Seventh-day Adventist church. And I'm sure many questions you have regarding the Sabbath will be answered because there are so many things online, Elder David, these days. We want to point people in the right direction to get questions answered regarding the Sabbath, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our next lesson is going to be Babylon the Great. So we hope you uh, join us for that one. That was just so beautiful. It's a fascinating study. Praise the Lord. And friends, right now we want to pray with you because we know you have studied and now there's some things going on in your heart. So we just want to pray for the Holy Spirit to seal you, cover you. And then Elder David will give some last comments and then we will close. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the study of Revelation 13 primarily tonight that explain what is the mark of the beast. Lord, I pray for your people who have watched and who have studied. Lord, that we will develop a personal relationship with you, that the bond that we have, nothing will come in between so that, Lord, you can guide us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, in the world today, there's turmoil. 
everywhere in Afghanistan, we see the turmoil. Lord, with this pandemic, we see the turmoil. People's hearts are failing them for fear. But you promise us that those who keep their minds stayed upon you will find peace, perfect peace, if we live in the word of God and we build our faith in you. Please help your people, Lord. Please send peace, Lord, to the hearts and comfort those who have lost um, family. And help us, oh God, to keep studying your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Elder David, in this time, there's so much turmoil. Is there any final encouragement you can give to our viewers before we close? Well, you're seeing all across the world uh, governments gaining more and more authority and power and not allowing people to make choices according to the dictates of their own conscience. Uh, people are being tested. And, you know, Jesus said something that was so important. It says, he said, in vain do they worship me. Um, when they when they worship when they keep the commandments of men or the traditions of men, and God wants us to keep His Ten Commandments and not follow the traditions of man. This Sunday worship is just a tradition; it's not in the Scripture, and yet the the. Church powers in the future are going to force people to do this, and it's going to come down to, are we going to obey God, or are we going to obey men? It's just that simple. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. So there you have it. Let's build our faith upon the word of God and what he says. And we can only do that by spending time in prayer and Bible study. Amen. That's All right. right, God bless you, friends. Um, we'll see you next time. Remember, please keep us in your in your prayers as we keep you in ours.